Good evening. I'm Spot on Weather meteorologist Matthew Euler, and welcome to a special video presentation. This topic is going to be on the polar vortex, nature's chilling reality. Uh, you know, I remember a while back in time how it seemed that El Nino and La Nina really seem to be making all the news as far as a weather phenomena. Uh, but in recent winters, uh, we have heard the term the polar vortex quite frequently. So in tonight's video, I plan to delve deeper into the topic of the polar vortex, uh, really look at what exactly the polar vortex is, and then also look back at past winters, um, the colder winters where the polar vortex was either split or weakened, stretched out or elongated, uh, as well as a couple of the milder, most recent winters. So, as you can see by these pictures on tonight's title presentation, uh, you see a lot of people bundled up. A lot of colder air that tends to filter down from the Arctic whenever the polar vortex weakens and, you know, exceptionally cold temperatures. If you're watching tonight from Texas, you definitely realize that based on last year, uh, this past winter in February, how we have the after effects of a polar vortex. Um, and how much colder it was and how unusual it was. You know, Houston, Texas had snow on the ground, uh, which is just completely unheard of. So it's a very important thing, uh, atmospheric phenomenon that affects our society as a whole. And it plays a big role in the actual sensible weather each winter season. So the first thing I'm going to do is start off with the polar vortex overview. I've got a few slides to cover. Um, generally, I'm going to talk about what the polar vortex actually is and some interesting facts about it. So first of all, the polar vortex is not a new concept. Uh, this refers to an area of low pressure that's situated over the Arctic region, swirling in a counterclockwise manner at the North Pole. And, and that circulation of air works inwards. It's a strong zonal, you have these strong zonal westerlies that circulate around these extremely cold or lower temperatures at the center of the polar vortex itself. Now, around the vortex's outer fringes, it typically resides the tropospheric polar front jet stream. And in tonight's video, you're going to hear me talk about the troposphere and the stratosphere. Uh, the troposphere is also known as the weather sphere. It's where we live here at the surface. We're technically at the bottom of the troposphere. That's where all the weather occurs in the atmosphere in the troposphere. If you go up above the troposphere in the vertical, we have a layer called the stratosphere, and I'm going to talk about specific warming conditions in the stratosphere that tend to result in weakening the polar vortex. And another important note is something known as coupling, where we get energy transfer um, from the troposphere to the stratosphere, and then from the stratosphere back down to the troposphere. And so I'll be talking about these spheres quite frequently in tonight's video. Now during some winters, the vortex actually remains symmetric in shape. Uh, what I mean by symmetric is circular, with the coldest air remaining locked over the polar area. There's some winters that we see this, and I'll give you a couple of examples later on. During other winters, the vortex becomes weak and displaced off the polar area, resulting in cold air outbreaks into the middle latitudes. And folks like Dr. Judah Cohen have termed this warm Arctic cold continent, where you get exceptional warming up in the Arctic regions, and that much colder air actually works its way towards the middle latitudes, uh, whether you live in the United States or Europe. Additionally, there's a large thermal or temperature difference between the air of the polar vortex, as I mentioned uh, on the last slide, how rigid the air is at the, in, within the polar vortex, and that difference between the air of the polar vortex and the air in the middle latitudes, that drives the polar front jet stream. Now, one big thing to really, really hone in on is the Arctic is warming twice as fast as other areas of Earth this tends to weaken that thermal or temperature gradient between the lower and the higher latitudes. Now, when you weaken the thermal gradient, generally 
uh, that tends to drive the strength of the jet stream. And with a weaker thermal gradient, you have a weaker jet stream. And that polar front jet stream then tends to um, become more amplified, to where we have deeper troughs and uh, much more amplified ridges poking into higher latitudes. So overall, this results in a weakening polar front jet stream. Again, more amplified troughs and ridges, where we get warm air advection that moves towards the high north and the Arctic regions, and we have the colder air advection moving towards the United States and Eurasia, Europe, um, in the middle latitudes. Now, the dynamic coupling between with that troposphere can cause the jet stream to shift southward, and that's going to allow for extreme weather conditions in both Eurasia and the United States. Those are the two primary areas of the after of this polar vortex tends to impact. Southward shifts in the vortex can result in severe surface weather during the winter season, uh, anomalously cold temperature anomalies, as well as snow and record storms. Now that research, I'm pulling that right directly as I cite these sources I used, that was from Overland et al. back in 2018. So just a big point to make here is that, you know, we get snow and record storms uh, as that polar vortex shifts southward towards the equator. But keep in mind, too, we can get snow in some very unusual places that normally don't get snow. Additionally, sensible weather and tropospheric circulation changes usually are going to lag up to 40 days after what's known as a sudden stratospheric warming event. Um, you know, a sudden stratospheric warming event is something that occurs when that second layer in the atmosphere, the stratosphere, it warms anomalously. And that warming in the stratosphere up at the polar level and the stratosphere tends to weaken the polar vortex. So what we get to disturb the polar vortex is we get this pronounced increase in what's known as upward wave activity flux from the troposphere to the stratosphere in the form of these breaking planetary Rosby waves. Zonal wind and temperature oscillations then occur within the stratosphere. You get a more disturbed stratospheric polar vortex and high planetary wave activity tends to lead to those major sudden stratospheric warming events where we have this anomalous warming in the stratosphere accompanied by a weakening zonal wind and actually a reversal of that zonal wind from westerly to easterly in the polar stratosphere and they get temperature increases as well. Now the splitting of the polar vortex in earlier midwinter can affect the variability in late winter and early spring. Um, so right now, if we look at real-time weather, what's going on right now, we did have a sudden stratospheric warming event that's taken place, and it has weakened the polar vortex. And we're talking right now, we're in late October in 2021, and we're already talking about a weakening of the polar vortex. Uh, so uh, it's real interesting that it's happening this early this particular year, um, and I'll talk about some other factors uh, as far as strength of the polar vortex to conclude tonight's presentation. But in general, the splitting of the polar vortex in early or midwinter, that can affect the variability in late winter and early spring, get weakened westerlies and higher temperatures. A less stable, colder polar vortex is more vulnerable to bursts of planetary wave activity propagating from the troposphere to the stratosphere and thus to sudden stratospheric warmings. Additionally, when we talk about sudden stratospheric warming, we can see temperatures rising 54 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 30 to 50 degrees Celsius, in just a few days. So this warming is rather drastic. Now when the polar stratosphere warms, Again, the wind that normally blows from west to east in the stratosphere weakens dramatically and may even reverse direction like we had um, in January of 2021. That corresponds to a polar vortex breakdown. There's a couple things that can happen with that polar vortex breakdown. We can have an elongation or stretching of the weakening polar vortex off the pole, or we can actually get a splitting into multiple lobes, um, which has occurred 
uh, in the last few winters. So in the darkness of that cold polar night, temperatures within the vortex, they can drop lower than negative 110 degrees Fahrenheit. That's just phenomenal cold, right? Areas affected, again, primarily going to include the United States, Europe, and Asia. All right, so let's take a look at the sudden stratospheric warming events. Uh, this information here I pulled from a research, research article. Um, Dr. Amy Butler actually has this posted, um, showing the number of sudden stratospheric warming events per winter. Those are represented by the gray bars, and you'll notice how we go back to the late 1950s with those gray vertical bars there on the right-hand side of the graphic. Um, and this is in accordance with a couple of uh, data sources, the ERA-40 and ERA interim data from 1958 to 2014. And then the number of downward sun stratospheric warming events is the red bars, uh, generally for the years 1979 to 2014. So those gray and those light red lines indicate the smooth frequency of occurrence for this respective time series. The underlying bars there with the years on the x-axis, the horizontal axis from 1850 to 2010. The dark red line is indi indicative of estimate of sudden stratospheric warming events with downward impact, while the shadow, the shading or shadowing indicates the uncertainty given by the 95th percentile. Now this is strictly, I grabbed this again from uh, Dr. Amy Butler, but the figures actually from research conducted by Domeisen 2019. Uh, the JGR is the source, so this is courtesy of Daniela Domeisen. So just going to show you the frequencies, especially when we look back to um, the year 2000 on the right-hand side of this graphic, uh, you'll notice quite a bit of frequency of the sudden stratospheric warming events. <clears throat> now, what's the difference between a stable polar vortex versus a disrupted polar vortex. Um, if you look at the graphic on the left, we have a stable polar vortex. Uh, the polar front jet stream generally stays further north, and this keeps colder air contained up over the Arctic region with milder air over the middle latitudes. So a stronger polar vortex yields milder winters across the middle latitudes in general, uh, United States and Europe. Now, when disrupted, that graphic on the right, notice that jet stream now uh, tends to, the tropospheric jet stream tends to um, amplify into a deeper trough across the Midwest and eastern United States. You get this warm air moving north through an uh, upper level ridge there in the northwest Atlantic, south of Greenland. And then you get another dip in that jet stream, transporting colder air into parts of uh, northern Europe. So when disrupted, the vortex actually becomes pretty weak, and it's either going to be displaced off the poles, elongated and stretched, or split into these multiple pieces or lobes. Now this is the average temperatures and mean sea level pressure 30 days after sudden stratospheric warming events. And there's a general relationship from research that tends to indicate the coldest temperatures um, usually occur in the eastern part of North America, specifically eastern United States, uh, after the sudden stratospheric warming events. And then the sea level pressure tends to be highest over the Arctic region with lower pressure uh, to into the mid-latitudes. Um, so in general, that graphic on the left, the blue shading indicates below normal temperature anomalies in degrees Celsius uh, at the surface. And on the right-hand side, we have mean sea level pressure anomalies in hectopascals, which is basically the same thing as a millibar. Um, so, again, coldest temperatures, eastern U.S. and Europe, 30 days after sudden stratospheric warming events. And on the right-hand side, you'll notice the orange shading indicates higher than normal uh, mean sea level pressure uh, over the Arctic region, the orange shading on the right-hand graphic, and lower than normal mean sea level pressure across the eastern United States, stretching across Europe. Um, so in general, this is generally what sets up. Uh, and the big thing I want to mention here is that there's a lag. There's, in this case, a 30-day lag. I'm showing you the relationship in general. 
Snowfall anomalies 30 days after sudden stratospheric warming events. Now the snow anomaly here is in millimeters. Um, in general, the green shading is indicative of above normal snowfall and the brown shading below normal snowfall. So we generally have below normal snowfall in the western United States, uh, over parts of the uh, northwest, uh, higher latitudes of the North Atlantic, into Greenland. And then we have above normal snowfall over the eastern United States, as well as northern Europe. This is 30 days after the sudden stratospheric warming events. So it not only impacts your uh, surface temperature anomalies in degrees Celsius on the left, your mean sea level pressure anomalies on the right, but these kind of sudden stratospheric warming events 30 days after that also impacts the snowfall anomalies. Now this is um, the source I used for this to pull this um, displacements and splits, the, the general dates of both vortex displacements versus splits. The source of this comes from Cohen and Jones, uh, their particular research paper titled Tropospheric Precursors and Stratospheric Warmings uh, back in 2011. So you can see uh, on that table there uh, that there's a lot of displacements on the left, you know, from 30 November 1958. Uh, all the way down to 22 February 2008. And then we have vortex splits where it breaks off into multiple lobes on the right-hand portion of the, of the table, um, generally from 30 January 1958 down through 9 February 2010. And looking at, I'm just going back in time now for tw the past 21 years, or basically just a little over two decades, um, you can see we've had uh, one, two, three, four, five, six vortex displacements and uh, vortex splits, we've had one, two, three, four, five vortex splits. So this happens more frequently than you would think. All right, so more specifically, um, more recently, uh, there also there's been some uh, sudden stratospheric warming events in March 2010, January 2013, February 2018, as well as January of 2019. And then not included here is 2021, January of 2021. So dating back to 1958, uh, there's been 18 sudden stratospheric warming events that have occurred during El Nino phase, the warm ENSO phase. Um, additionally, we've had 15 sudden stratospheric warming events occurring during La Nina, the cold ENSO phase. And 10 sudden stratospheric warming events have occurred during neutral ENSO conditions. So I wanted to take a look at not only the vortex displacements and splits, uh, but then kind of tie that in with El Nino winners, La Nina winners, and neutral, and so neutral winners, just to kind of see where the numbers fell out. So dating back to 1958, um, it appears that we've had um, a little bit more of the sudden stratospheric warming events occurring during the El Nino warm phase and so as compared to the cold phase La Nina. Um, additionally, I wanted to go and take a look at the quasi-biennial oscillation, either a westerly-based QBO or an easterly-based QBO, <clears throat> and look to see, um, per the research, what the number of sudden stratospheric warming events were in both a westerly versus an easterly QBO, and they're fairly close, 21 and 22 respectively. Now, the source of this particular data I pulled directly from Dr. Amy Butler um, from the Sudden Stratospheric Warming Database. There's the link at the bottom right. This is a great source of data if you want to dig deeper into Sudden Stratospheric Warming events. Um, a really resourceful website. All right, so now I'm going to go back in time and we're going to look we're going to look at the past winners, some of the more memorable winners going back to 1985, and then I'll also talk about some more recent winners. And so the first thing I wanted to show is on the left there, uh, 1 January 1985 is on the far left, the stratosphere beneath that in, in letter C. So A and C are 1985, letters B and D on the left are 2009, 24 January 2009. <clears throat> so I wanted to show in the stratosphere generally um, the fact that we have those, um, those higher pressures 
the warmer temperatures in the stratosphere, every time we get uh, these polar vortex, the weakening polar vortex, we get that sudden stratospheric warming, and that's indicative of letters A and B for 1985 and 2009. That orangish, dark orange shading indicates that warming over the Arctic region. And then the bottom, I'm showing um, some general information about pressure patterns in the troposphere um, associated with a sudden stratospheric warming with the lowest mean sea level pressure, the blue shading, and the yellow mustard color, uh, the higher pressure over the Arctic region. If you look at the graphic on the right, um, this generally shows in 1985, January 1st, uh, where we had some downward propagating energy transfer. This is a case where the uh, initial coupling occurred with a planetary wave, um, basically breaking from the troposphere to the stratosphere, leading to the sudden stratospheric warming, and then some of that energy got coupled back from the stratosphere to the troposphere, uh, per the NAM index there on the right in, on January 1st, 1985, there, indicated by the arrow. Other uh, maps here I want to show for the polar vortex winter impacts in 1985. Um, again, looking at temperatures a little more close up. Now that graphic on the left is surface temperature anomalies in degrees Celsius, 30 days after the sun's stratospheric warming event. Uh, in general, surface temperatures, uh, we have uh, a warmer Arctic and a colder continent. Note the milder temperatures and the uh, light orange shading over the Arctic and the coldest blue shading, the coldest temps over the U.S. as well as Eurasia. That's darker blue there. So we're talking 5 to 10 degrees Celsius below normal uh, for parts of the British Isles on down into France, Germany, Central Europe. Uh, so that was a pretty good one for um, Europe this particular year. We look at January 2009 showing the evolution of the sudden stratospheric warming event in 2009 on the left. And so we're doing 21 to 11 days before on the far left. Notice the blue shading there, how the stratospheric temperatures are what they should be. They're, they're cold, very cold. Um, but over time, uh, that middle graphic there on the left is basically uh, 10, to, 10 days up to the actual sudden stratospheric warming. And you'll notice how the orange and the yellows invade over the, um, into the stratosphere over the Arctic region. And the far right there graphic shows uh, one to 11 days after the sun's stratospheric warming and how very mild or warm the um, sudden the uh, stratosphere is over the Arctic region. We're talking about uh, on the order of 20 to 30 degrees Celsius above normal in this particular stratospheric warming event in 2009. If you look at the graphic on the right, that is showing uh, the graphic uh, there on the right-hand side, the left of the two graphics, shows that orange, almost like a maroon shading color. That's indicative of a symmetrical um, polar vortex at one point. Uh, then it splits off into multiple pieces there on the far right by 2 February, about 30 days later after the sudden stratospheric warming. You have two distinct polar vortex lobes. Uh, one is into uh, the northern U.S. and the other one is positioned around into Eurasia in this example. Another really eventful winter was February 2010, where uh, I wanted to show you some of the, um, the temperature anomaly impacts there on the left. Uh, of course, the darkest blue shading there across Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas. It was that very dark blue shading on that graphic on the left for um, divisional ranks of how cold the air was in February 2010 um, with the weakening polar vortex. That was record coldest air, all right? And then the lighter blue shading is much below normal. So you can see a big swath of the eastern U.S. all the way down to the Gulf Coast in Florida were impacted by the sudden stratospheric warming and the weakening polar vortex in February 2010. The graphic on the right shows 500 millibar heights and anomalies in meters from the NSEP reanalysis in February 2010. And what do you know? Look at this. You have um, the maroon shading, the oranges over the Arctic region, indicating um, anomalously high heights. And then you have anomalously low heights, positioned pretty much matching up with the graphic on the left where the coldest temperatures were. Generally, the, the lowest anomal anomalously low heights 
at 500 millibars were over the eastern U.S. and the southern U.S. <clears throat> now, if we look back to January 2014, um, the winter of 2013-14 was just an interesting winter overall. <clears throat> Look at the graphic on the left. That's the 500 millibar geopotential height meters. That's the anomaly. The purple shading indicates the location of anomalously low 500 millibar heights. Um, so I would suspect, just looking at that graphic, that the polar vortex had um, descended down just to the south of Hudson Bay in this case. Um, the blue indicative of those lower than normal 500 millibar heights. And then the maroons and the oranges are indicative of a much above normal heights. So look at the heights of, in the Gulf of Alaska, for example, that um, almost like the maroonish shading there, uh, much above normal heights in the Gulf of Alaska. And that leads to a negative Eastern Pacific oscillation. Um, and uh, yeah, you're going to get much colder air. The jet stream is going to the polar front jet stream is going to basically dip from the higher Arctic regions down to the U.S. and bring much frigid air, um, especially considering this was January, one of the coldest months already. The graphic on the right shows differences from average of the temperature at the surface in degrees Fahrenheit from January 5th to the 7th of 2014. And notice this weakening polar vortex. You know, this had impacts not only in the United States, which was much below normal, uh, but also over parts of Siberia was much below normal, over parts of Russia, for example. <clears throat> if we look at the United States again, and specifically we look at early January, um, <laughs> the air temperature is on the left, and the apparent temperature, when I say apparent temperature, we're factoring in the wind as well as the air temperature. So the combination of the two is more of the wind chill. If you look at the graphic on the right, it's wind chills, um, the apparent temperature, what it feels like. So the air temperature on the left, you can see how frigid the air was in early January 2014 in the wake of this uh, weakening polar vortex and the sudden stratospheric warming. And so you'll see, you see in this case, uh, on the morning at 10 a.m. on January 6th, uh, central time, the temperature in Chicago was 16 below zero. This is air temperatures. Minneapolis, 18 below zero. Um, eight degrees above zero all the way down to Nashville, Tennessee. Um, so you can see how frigid the air is all the way down the Gulf Coast where Houston is sitting at 28 degrees at 10 a.m. their time, their local time on January 6, 2014. So a lot of the United States was just frigid. And then the wind chills on the right, I mean, just, just wow. Negative 47 degree wind chill there in eastern parts of North Dakota you got negative 41, you know, negative 47 at International Falls. I mean, Minnesota is just shivering. Parts of Montana, North Dakota, negative 55 degree wind chill um, in the far part, far northern parts of North Dakota in the wake of the January 2014 event. <clears throat> now, working our way closer to the current time period, if we look at February of 2019, these are the global temperature anomalies um, based on the um, the climatology, the 19, I believe this was um, 1981 to 2010 climo data. Um, this, by the way, this graphic on the left is excellent. This is from the Climate Reanalyzer Re website, uh, climatereanalyzer.org. You can look back at past temperatures across the globe, and it's a really, really cool site. But in general, the uh, purple and the blue shadings indicate colder than normal temperatures. And for the United States, this was a really interesting winter. You know, uh, we had a significant weakening of the polar vortex um, into uh, January, uh, December into January. And I remember this one specifically. Um, you know, this goes to prove that sometimes the after effects of the weakening polar vortex, uh, they don't exactly pan out where we would traditionally expect the coldest temperatures to be. Um, initially, uh, in late January 2019, uh, the air was frigid in the upper Midwest down into the Ohio River Valley. It was extremely frigid air. And then um, the southeastern ridge just poked its head up. And uh, the orange shading on this graphic on the left indicates warmer than normal temps. Um, so it actually, the coldest air associated, the very bitterly cold air associated with the after effects of the weakened polar vortex, the coldest air actually shifted from the upper Midwest back towards western Canada and the northern plain states 
Um, and that was in association with a persistent upper level trough in that area that the pattern just didn't change. The upper level ridge built into the southeast and mid-Atlantic and uh, yeah, it was actually a milder February. Um, so again, looking at Europe here too, I, I wanted to mention that um, parts of Western Europe, Northern Europe, warmer than normal. And so again, uh, not, uh, not every polar vortex weakening event is going to be identical in its after effects. And that's what makes this very challenging. We know the general rules of thumb uh, are for the coldest air to be in the eastern part of the United States, eastern North America. Uh, but yeah, this one just didn't do exactly what we thought it would do. Looking now at January 2020, uh, 2021, wow, this was an impressive, impressive situation. Uh, we had a major uh, midwinter sudden stratospheric warming event there on the left. This, now, that graphic on the left is the GFS analysis. This is courtesy of Severe Weather Europe. And this was on 5 January of 2021, just after the new year this year. And look at the orange coloring the maroon coloring, and we're talking about a sudden stratospheric warming. Uh, this is 10 millibar temperature in degrees Celsius. It's just extremely warm in the polar stratosphere of the Arctic. And then the blue shading indicating those colder temperatures up at 50 millibars, very high up in the atmosphere. And um, so normally we should see those blue, those colder um, stratospheric temperatures um, over the Arctic region, over the North Pole. But in this case, we have them over the North Pole and the Arctic region. Looking at the graphic on the right, uh, this generally shows the temperatures in degrees uh, in Kelvin. Um, by the way, this graphic on the right was courtesy of P. Newman at NASA, E. Nash of SSAI, and S. Pawson of NASA. But generally, um, you see at the bottom there on the x-axis, the horizontal axis, this is showing you the different events, the different color lines represent different events. So, for example, the 7879 uh, to 2019, 2020, uh, we have all that represented on this graphic on the right. And then 2019, 2020 shows how temperatures uh, drastically warmed in the stratosphere in 2019, 2020, but a little bit later in the year uh, into March. 2020, 21 winter, we see that uh, late December early January period where the temperatures rose up to about 235 Kelvin in the stratosphere. And this is uh, the zonal mean temperature uh, up at 10 millibars or hectopascals um, between 60 and 90 degrees north latitude. So you see these spikes on the graphic on the right that indicates that sudden stratospheric warming. So the overall polar vortex winter impacts, wow. January and February 2021, very interesting time for the United States. Um, you know, the graphic on the left it runs from 18 December 2020 to 16 April 2021. And you see the coupling there in um, energy transfer from the stratosphere back to the troposphere in the early parts of February of 2021. That's where that solid dark line I, I put in there. Uh, that's what I'm that's what we're showing. And then below that graphic on the left, you see the Arctic Oscillation Index. Um, so the tropospheric AO, Arctic Oscillation, is a direct reflection of the strength of the polar vortex. So when the um, polar vortex recovers or becomes strong, we typically see a positive AO. Where those blue bars are above the zero line there in the lower left. But at the time we had this coupling of energy transfer from the stratosphere back to the troposphere, look how the Arctic Oscillation, the AO index dropped significantly, especially uh, as we got into around the 7th of February uh, to about the 14th of February. Uh, we have the energy transfer, um, the stratospheric Arctic Oscillation turned sharply negative, the energy transfer downward, and then the tropospheric AO index also became sharply negative there. And so, uh, you know, one of the clues of the strength of the polar vortex, the stratospheric polar vortex, is to look at that, um, the Arctic Oscillation Index. And uh, usually they'll coincide with each other. Stronger stratospheric polar vortex, much more positive Arctic Oscillation, much more highly zonal jet stream from west to east. Coldest air remains up over the Arctic, 
milder in the middle latitudes with a positive AO, and then with a negative AO, we get a uh, we get a much big bigger dip in the jet stream that tends to bring much colder air down into the middle latitudes. Whether we're talking uh, the eastern United States or whether we're talking Europe, Siberia, um, yeah, it's going to be a reflection. So. Graphic on the right, great uh, NCEP NCAR reanalysis graphic I pulled in here, generally showing you the sea level pressure in millibars, the anomaly in it. So we're looking at sea level pressure anomalies in millibars in the graphic on the right, um, courtesy of the NOAA Physical Science Lab, Sciences Laboratory. Look at the maroon and orange shading just sitting over the northern, the North Pole area. Uh, we're looking on the order of 8 to 10 millibar higher than normal pressure as compared to 1981 to 2010 climatology. And this time period on the graphic on the right is from January 1st, 2021 to February 28th, 2021. So just impressive how much higher than normal the sea level pressure was over the Arctic during this particular time period, January and February earlier this year in 2021. Um, so just wanted to show you what that looked like. If we look at the graphic on the left, again, courtesy of climatereanalyzer.org. Now, this is the two-meter temperature anomalies in degrees Celsius for Friday, February 19th, 2021. Look at the blue and the purple shading um, that are now, at this point in time, situated from southern, south-central Canada down into the central United States, all the way down to Texas. Uh, Texas at this time, on February 19th, was looking at surface temperature anomalies on the order of uh, 18 to 25 degrees Fahrenheit below, or Celsius, 18 to 24 degrees Celsius below normal. Warmest temperatures during this time were over northeastern Canada, and then you look over the Arctic again, you see that red, that lighter red shading, and we're talking about 18 to 24 degrees Celsius above normal temperature anomalies over the North Pole. Again, the warm Arctic cold continent concept um, that has been conducted in past research. Deep freeze in February 2021 over Texas, no doubt about it, the lingering impacts of the polar vortex. Now, I showed you some exceptionally colder cases of a weakening polar vortex, sudden stratospheric warming and a weakening polar vortex. Now let me show you a couple of recent winters where we had a strong polar vortex leading to warm mid-latitude winters. So let's look at that. First one I want to look back at six years ago, 2015. Wow, I remember this winter very well. Um, I remember it around Christmas specifically um, in southeast Virginia uh, where the temperature was 80 degrees back-to-back -back days, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. It was unreal how warm it was. Uh, the departures from normal. Overall, in 2015, we saw the strongest polar vortex in nearly 68 years. All right, we had a formation of very cold, strong Arctic polar vortex. There was reduced, that, that Rosby or planetary wave propagation was reduced into the middle high latitude upper stratosphere. So there's really nothing to really weaken the polar vortex. Uh, overall, we had a very strong polar vortex, very mild temperatures as a result in the middle latitudes, including the U.S. Uh, we generally had a highly zonal west to east polar front jet stream, kept the coldest air well up to the north in the Arctic region. Um, and then Sabatis and Manning, they did research in 2000. They listed three factors for producing an unusually cold polar vortex, and I wanted to share these. I think this is, this is great research. Number one, less planetary wave activity from the troposphere to the stratosphere. Two, we get prolonged periods of small planetary wave activity. So if we do get periods of it, it's smaller, less intense. And then three, we get a structure that generally prevents planetary wave propagation into mid and high latitude upper stratosphere. Look at the temperature departures from normal from December 2015 to February 2016. No, it did not feel like Christmas at all that winter. Um, it was just exceptionally warm from coast to coast in the U.S. Um, you know, we're looking at the northern part of the U.S. there on the order of uh, 8 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit above normal overall. Uh, the data source 
for much of the material there on the right hand side was Matthias et al. They did a research paper on the extraordinarily strong and cold polar vortex in early northern winter 2015-16. Um, so that was that was put together in 2016. That particular research is an excellent source I took a look at. Um, and again, these are some excellent um, <laughs> factors for producing an unusually cold polar vortex. Sabatis and Manny in 2000 uh, looked at uh, what happens. Why is there an unusually cold polar vortex? Why does it remain so strong? Now, the 2019-20 winter season polar vortex, uh, this is even more recent. And this was a very warm winter um, from December 2019 to February 2020 um, across the anywhere from the Mississippi River to the East Coast and up to New England. Um, you know, <laughs> no blue on that map on the left for temperature departures, none. Uh, we got peach shading. We've got a darker peach coloring. Uh, where the temperatures are much above average. Again, it's a case of a winter where the polar vortex remains strong, the coldest air remains locked up over the Arctic, and then record-breaking Arctic oscillations, positive Arctic oscillations, and strongest polar vortex since the satellite era began 40 years prior. Um, locally, for Virginia, I wanted to throw the graphic in at the bottom right, the average temperatures were running 4 to 7 degrees above normal. 4 to 7 degrees Fahrenheit. Richmond, Virginia saw their sixth warmest winter on record. Norfolk, Virginia saw their fourth warmest winter on record. And if you look at the average temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit there on the bottom right, um, those are the rankings. So the winter of 1889-90, number one, where the um, mean temperature for that winter we're talking the months of December, January, and February. It was 51.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Number two on that list, 1931-32, uh, 51.4 degrees Fahrenheit was the mean temperature that winter. And then 2019-2020, fourth warmest, 48.5 degrees Fahrenheit mean temperature for that particular three-month winter period. Um, so real interesting stuff here. Um, you know, 2011-2012 winter was also quite mild as well as the 15-16 winter, which I talked about in the previous slide, uh, where the average temperature, or the mean temperature was 47.7 degrees Fahrenheit. So, again, very interesting. We got not only look at the weakening polar vortex winters and the extreme cold, but the opposite can also occur where that polar vortex just remains so strong. Very positive Arctic oscillation throughout the whole winter. So, to conclude tonight's brief, I wanted to go over additional factors and the polar vortex behavior. All right, so I have a couple slides here, and we're going to talk about these. The three most prominent factors regarding the strength of the polar vortex. These include the quasi-biennial oscillation, I shortened it by abbreviating it QBO, the solar cycle, believe it or not, and El Nino. Now, research was conducted by Holton and Tan back in 1980. And this is another very interesting research paper. They found a relationship between the mean zonal wind and the planetary wave activity in the northern hemisphere stratosphere by the QBO, known as the Holton-Tan effect. The consensus is that during easterly phase QBO, the planetary waves from the troposphere tend to be reflected poleward, leading to a more disturbed polar vortex. Holton, this Holton-Tan effect starts in November in the middle latitudes, and then it peaks in December and January in the middle and high latitudes. Um, so um, there's other research out there by um, Dunkerton um, talking about the QBO and the, uh, the ENSO phase as well. Um, so there's other interesting research out there beyond just the Holton Tan paper here. But this is a really interesting. Um, so in general, Holton Tan found that, again, the easterly phase QBO, we tend to have a weaker or more disturbed polar vortex in the stratosphere. During westerly QBO, the polar vortex tends to be colder and stronger. Uh, Lebitsky et al. in 2002 stated that besides the QBO phase, they found and discovered that the solar cycle has an influence on the strength of the polar vortex. So I found that pretty interesting. 
Uh, being that we're in a solar minimum, we're climbing out of that now. Things are getting a little bit more active um, on the sun. Uh, but the early polar vortex tends to be colder and stronger during a solar maximum as compared to a solar minimum. Um, so that is really, really interesting stuff. And then lastly, the polar vortex is warmer and weaker during El Nino, the warm Enso phase, as compared to La Nina or the neutral Enso phase. And that research was conducted by multiple folks, uh, multiple researchers, Camp and Tongue in 2007, Garfinkel and Hartman in 2008, and then Graf and Zakatin in 2012. So lots of cool, interesting tidbits here I wanted to share with you um, to include tonight's video. Um, you know, just really phenomenal stuff here. Um, overall, the polar vortex plays a significant role in winter weather in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, you know, I always drum this up, but Dr. Judah Cohen, um, AER, Atmospheric Environmental Research, uh, check it out. He does the weekly blogs, and they're just really amazing. Uh, he's done some amazing research in the field looking at the, um, the polar vortex, the stratospheric polar vortex, favorable factors um, for weakening of that vortex. Additionally, Dr. Amy Butler, uh, amazing research as well. So um, I've used a lot of different resources. I want to make sure to cite and give credit definitely from the researcher standpoint. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video tonight on the polar vortex. Um, I didn't throw up an actual slide right now of the current conditions. I usually do that in my weekly teleconnection discussion videos. But in general, we have stratospheric warming that's occurring now. Uh, we do expect a weakening polar vortex. Looking at the latest weather models, it appears that it's going to be more of a stretch or elongated vortex, not a split um, at this particular point in time. Um, so now after this occurs, what happens with the polar vortex? We're in an easterly QBO this winter. So does that mean that we're going to have a um, more than one weakening of the vortex over the course of winter months? Um, that remains to be seen. Or will that vortex just strengthen back to full strength and just become strong and remain perched up over the North Pole? That all remains to be seen. Um, but we definitely have to factor that into the winter forecast. Right. The easterly phase QBO tends to lead to colder winters across the eastern U.S. Um, and then that weakening polar vortex. Those can be two huge implications in the overall temperature departures this winter season. We know La Nina is out there. We know the uh, negative Pacific decadal oscillations out there as well, which tend to favor milder temperatures across the eastern U.S. Um, but again, uh, I think the strength of La Nina is going to be very important in the winter forecast. Um, so... That wraps things up tonight, spot on weather. I, again, hope you enjoy these presentations. You're going to learn a little bit. Um, until next time, I wish everybody the best. Take care and God bless.